Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Those of you joining us from home, welcome. We have two council members joining us uh, remotely today. And uh, just one quick housekeeping item. The last section of the agenda are other department discussions. We have items one, two, and three that are marked for discussion. Number one, we're going to move to the end. Okay, well, with that, we will uh, begin under presentations. We have a presentation uh, of the Lynn County Patch Program by Tracy Achenbach. Tracy, are you with us? I am here, Mayor, thank you. Welcome. Um, so Tom had asked if I would want to just briefly, very briefly, because I saw your uh, list of items to cover today, yikes. Um, just a little bit about the patch program. So this program was a result of uh, a few of us talking about a concern for homeowners in our, in our um, county uh, as a result of the August 10th derecho. And so uh, some of us started to meet and talk about what we could do um, renters were being directed to call Waypoint and Waypoint was uh, trying to direct them to the right places, but we were concerned about homeowners. So that kind of resulted in um, the PATH program, which stands for Providing Assistance to Community Homeowners. Um, we're actually, this is a great week to be uh, bringing this up to you because it rolls out this week, I think. Uh, we finally... Um, problem solved with FEMA a little bit. And it, it sounds like um, we are planning to um, send out the press release on Thursday and hopefully have the program live on Friday. Um, homeowners will be able to, um, so it, it's a collaboration of many entities. In the news release, actually, the city of Marion is represented. Um, I have listed them in the, in the news release, uh, as well as the city of Cedar Rapids and the a lot of organizations that have been part of this because Tom Treharn from the city of Marion has been participating in some of these meetings, um, just trying to stay informed about, about what, what can happen for homeowners. So really what we're, we were fortunate enough to, the Housing Fund for Lynn County has been uh, provided some funding from the United Way and from the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. And that funding is helping to pay for a position to, to be an intake person, a coordinator, to uh, process requests from homeowners. And then what we're hoping to do is either be able to direct them if they need help with construction management, they just don't know how to work through the process with, with contractors or how to find one or things like that. That's one thing. And then the other side of it is financial. So what we're hoping to do is utilize some of these funds that we're being given uh, the Neighborhood Finance Corporation is going to do this for all of Lynn County. Homeowners would be able to um, get access to funds to help maybe pay in advance of getting their FEMA money and their insurance money, and then also be able to have forgiven if there's a gap. So like the deductible amount, or if the work requires more than uh, what's gonna be covered with other money. We are able to help people up to 15,000. We are limiting. I see on the sheet that I provided, um, the income limits are shown there. So we are limiting it. In the beginning, we're limiting it to people uh, with low to moderate income. So we have no idea how it's gonna roll, how, um, you know, what kind of a response we'll get, but we're, we are guessing it will be a, um, it will be a popular program with people. But again, that, the news release will be um, released on Thursday and hopefully be live on Friday. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think this is a, a great, um, a great uh, project. Um, I see that this is a collaboration of, of uh, organizations that participate in LAPAID. Would you mind just 
explaining to, the, to those who don't know what LAP aid is real quick, because I think that's a, a group that serves a very important purpose and has during this entire year. Uh, and I'm not sure that everyone is aware of what LAP aid is. Well, LAP aid is a, is a group of organizations. It's a huge group. It's Golly, I'm thinking there's maybe sometimes on the calls there might be 70 different organizations represented. And the whole intent is to try and respond to disasters, to try and to coordinate and um, identify the needs. And actually out of those calls, that was one of the, you know, one of the early ones. Um, we were already, we had met all year in response to COVID and had kind of gone to deciding, okay, maybe we only need to meet once a month or, you know, and then, and then derecho hit and then that changed again. We went back to, to meeting all the time, but this is really a result of that disaster group that, um, that is formed in the county. And I don't have the history, but I'm going to guess it was probably formed as a result of the 2008 flood and then stayed intact and, and is, um, um, how do I want to say, is started back up again when a disaster um, hits and and a response is needed. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that explanation. I just think it's everyone. It's important for everyone to know that 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 group exists. Um, it's a mm -hmm. uh, collaboration of all types of human services organizations, yeah. government organizations, and their purpose is to coordinate response to disasters. And um, I know I've been on a number of the calls throughout the year um, and appreciate all the work you do. We'll open it up for questions from the council for Tracy. Yes, go ahead, Will. Yeah, Tracy, do, uh, do mobile homes qualify for this? Oh, I was afraid I would get this question. So one of the, one of the thing is that the, the group decided with these loan funds that we are not making them, um, we are, well, mobile homes are eligible if, they, if their tax is real estate. But one of the things that we have decided to do, we just had this discussion on a call yesterday, uh, the collaborative group, is that I want to be able to collect data on the people who need help from the mobile homes, and then we may look for other sources of funding to be able to um, meet those needs. As you probably know, uh, the mobile home um, issue can sometimes be a difficult one to solve. Um, but we're but we are going to, as far as the loan, the forgivable loan program for this, we are not mobile homes that are that are not taxed as real estate won't be eligible. But we are going to and have received um, calls already from people who live in mobile home parks, just so that we have a better idea of what the need is and how we might be able to solve it. Like I'm thinking maybe with some funders, if we know the numbers, we might be able to come up with a solution. Okay, that's a good question because I, might, I would bet that that's gonna be a large part of any need for help in Marion would be uh, mobile home. Yeah, I, I know there are a lot, there's a lot of need yeah. in the mobile home parks right now with, with folks that just can't afford to even just skirting around their home. They can't afford to fix the skirting, which is insulation in the winter. So it could affect the pipes freezing in a mobile home, so. Right. Well, and, and we do have, you know, a portion of this that we talked about earlier was Matthew 25 was, was um, you know, uh, trying to help people who were, had emergency needs and that would certainly qualify as one of those things. We have also, all, talked about in our collaborative group about volunteer organizations um, who would maybe be willing to problem solve some of those things to help mobile home owners. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, I've been in close communications with Marion Village and a little bit with Squaw Creek, but not uh, real close with them. Um, but speaking right now, I speak on behalf of Marion Cares. I'm the president of Marion Cares this year. And I, at our staff meeting, uh, our board meeting last week, I think it was, we were, we, we had helped Marion Cares had helped, I think almost 50 
mobile home owners or renters or owners, it would be owners, to put the skirting back around. So Marion Cares has been really, really uh, diving into both Marion Village and Squaw Creek over the last few months to respond to some of the needs that are, um, it, it's just difficult to foot, fit a mobile home into the housing assistance programs that exist. So uh, I know the Methodist Church has also been extremely uh, supportive of, of both mobile home parks as well. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Anyone else have questions for Tracy? Well, it looks like that we are tied in pretty well into this group and their and their work with Tom uh, Tom's involvement, and uh, um, hopefully uh, we'll see uh, a good progress for our community through this through this program. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. And let us know uh, if there's anything else that we can do to to help or help you get the word out. Okay, I will do that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Moving on with the consent agenda, no, no items on page one on the first page are marked or the second page. Any, any of those items in particular people would like to discuss? All right, on the top of the third page of item B2 is marked for discussion. Resolution approving affidavit with Cedar Rapids Lynn County Solid Waste Agency for the curbside recycling program incentive. That Mr. Miller. Your Honor and Council, thank you. This is more of a FYI and uh, leading into budget. Wanted to give the Council kind of a heads up on this. This is an annual program that was offered or that is offered by the Solid Waste Agency. It's an incentive to maintain curbside recycling uh, for the city of Marion. When the recycling market started to go sideways, um, it became very difficult financially to justify curbside recycling uh, collections. So uh, by executing this resolution, which staff is recommending, we will receive this incentive just over $66,000. However, the staff at the Solid Waste Agency has indicated this will be the last year for this program. So that will have a budgetary effect uh, on the solid waste fees. With that, we are we are anticipating to see another increase in tipping fees for recycling. So uh, that's more, again, more of an FYI to the council as we go into the budget season. Okay, so there won't be any action on this? No action, uh, we'll approve it, uh, recommending approval, and then uh, obviously we'll, we'll receive oh, those okay. revenues. So there yep. will be yes. an action item on yeah. Thursday to recommend yes, approval sir. of yep. the affidavit? Yep. And then, okay. Any questions? Yes, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, Ryan, is there, do you foresee there will be a, any point in the future that the recycling market will recover itself? No. <clears throat> it, it, not, not, not how it, it, it exists because most of the recycling market were, was built around paper and that's not there anymore. Um, you're not building a lot of paper mills anymore. So a lot of the, the valuable recycling like newsprint, everything that's, that's going away. So. You'll never see the same recycling market again. Now it could change, and the type of recycling materials may change. How we collect it, how we sort it, things. But the way it is right now, no, it, it will never. Okay. Recover. All right. Thank you. Other questions for Ryan? Okay. Thank yeah. you, Ryan. Thank you, sir. The remainder of that page is. Uh, not marked for, for discussion. Is there anything on that page or the following? Following two pages. So under engineering, nothing is marked. Under community development, on, um, nothing is marked until F7. Anything prior to F7 under community development that any council member would like to discuss? Okay, moving on to F7 under community development. This 
this is a pretty straightforward uh, item. I just wanted to bring it to the attention of the city council. Usually when we're talking about the annexation of such a large parcel of ground, we, we, we like to highlight it. So this is out east of town, north of the uh, Marion Airport um, and includes uh, the property east of Squaw Creek uh, Village Mobile Home Park. Uh, and the property directly adjacent to this, while it is farm field, is, is actually annexed um, into the city. It's the old uh, Dostal farm. And uh, some of the properties owned by the city, uh, some by the water department, and uh, the developers have purchased that, and then they've, they've actually reached down now and acquired the property all the way down to 151. So um, <clears throat> you can see they've attached all the documentation regarding the annexation. We'll be processing this. We've seen some concepts for redevelopment out here in the past, and uh, it's pretty exciting. We've got a, a mix of uses um, that's been talked about. You can see there's a large uh, uh, lowland area in the center, where, which, which I really foresee that being a regional detention basin to kind of serve that whole area. So this will be an exciting project as we move into the new year and anticipate rezonings and platting and such uh, come spring. So. Any questions on it? It's just a receiving file, so you'll there'll be a lot more to come on this. But questions for Tom? Yes, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, Tom. So, is there any any notion of the type of future develop that, development that would go in there, or is it just more general at this point? <laughs> well, at this point, it's really general. But we did see uh, some concepts some time ago on it. Uh, really, what what I'd see is some commercial along um, uh, 151. And then as you go further north, you're going to find it to be a mix of residential uses, similar to, similar to what you're seeing out uh, in that area, I think. So uh, I do see there's going to be a school site north of here and currently in the city is designated a school site. Um, and there's some parkland as well. I don't think I mentioned that before. And uh, there's a location for proposed water tower. So I do see us moving into kind of a, uh, a nice planning process as we go through the redevelopment of this area. So I think there'll be a lot of public conversations about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Tom? I Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Will, sorry. Does the height restrictions from the airport affect this property at all? So along the east boundary, um, you will have a little bit of the approach zone and I believe there's some uh, multi-family housing restrictions in that area. Uh, when we were talking about this some time ago, um, I think there was a, at the time they were looking at being able to mitigate through land use planning, but it is an area that I think we'll probably wanna take a look at um, without getting into all the details that um, it's, as you get that far out of the approach zone, it might be better that those uses would be identified as an additional review rather than just an outwardly uh, no-go. So something we got to look at. Yep. Any additional questions? Thank you, Tom. There's one item under library, which is not marked for discussion. If anyone would like to discuss that, please say so. Otherwise, we'll move on to the abstention consent agenda. Nothing is marked on that for discussion. Does anyone have anything in particular they want to discuss on that agenda? All right, moving on to the regular agenda under administrative services, we have Item A1 is marked for discussion, a public hearing and conclusion of reverse referendum process for the general obligation disaster recovery loan agreement proposal. Um, we have Amal here. Good afternoon, Your Honor. On Thursday, we'll be holding a public hearing on an interim financing for disaster recovery expenses on um, and not to exceed 40 million amount. A little update on the project. This is category A um, uh, and it's a contracted services for collection uh, of debris, uh, soil related. 
so far, uh, this project is estimated at 34, 35 almost. Uh, million in cost broken into two uh, right of way collection and waterway collection. Our local share is expected to be a little over 5 million. What do we add on that? So far, we've been invoiced about 13 million to date. Uh, we've paid about almost uh, 12 million out of cash we have on hand in capital projects fund. So staff is recommending putting out a request for proposals on a line of credit um, on uh, an amount not to exceed 25 million term is four year interest only amortized over five years. Um, city reserves the ability to reduce or terminate the uh, facility in full or in part anytime. We applied for FEMA assistance and we're expecting to receive 85% of that. Can move in. So far, uh, we are at 55, uh, 66.5 million in outstanding uh, general obligation debt uh, that would put us at 42% of our statutory uh, debt limit. Um, in front of you is a table showing a forecast, um, uh, assuming 3% growth, which is uh, a little conservative here, that would put us at uh, uh, 157 million in statutory debt limit. Um, year over year, uh, we're expecting CIP schedule to add about 3.5 million. If we, if we look at the 25 million, we're, we'll be committing to uh, disaster recovery, even though we're planning on drawing on as needed basis. However, the full 25 will count towards our that capacity. Looking at the impact on that, that would put us a little bit over our uh, self-imposed limit, but we're still going to be or maintain being uh, um, under 60% of our uh, legal limit, still conservative. So, so far we've been working with our legal and bond counsel to draft an RFP. Uh, we're expecting to finalize this uh, RFP soon and we'll come back to council for action on awarding contract. Any question for me? Okay, questions? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Amal, so what you're showing here is for all subsequent years after fiscal year 21 is the entire $25 million on the line of subject to statutory limit. Is that correct? Yes. The term is four year and we're expecting to carry that over uh, five years just, okay. just to give us some time. And we're, we're not planning on carrying it longer. Uh, we're expecting receipts from FEMA uh, as soon as uh, March. Right, so given that, I'm assuming because we have a $25 million line of credit, the entire amount would have to be included in the subject to statutory limit yeah. line. And only outstanding. Only the outstanding? Will count towards our um, the service. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm a little confused then because we know that if the city share is five million, a little over five million dollars, the rest of that will should be reimbursed to the city within the next twelve months. Yes. Hopefully six months if we're if we're fortunate with FEMA. So given that scenario, why would we even be talking about or trying to show these kind of numbers beyond uh, even fiscal year twenty two? So it seems like at that point in time, all we should be talking about, I could see during fiscal year 21, 
we've got the entire amount as we fund all of the expenses up to the $35 million estimated. But with after that all gets paid off, the biggest challenge we have is how to fund the remaining $5 million. So I'm a little confused why we're trying to show these numbers clear out to all these subsequent years. This is the worst case scenario. We'll be reimbursed in increments. So we've broken uh, category A into four different projects. So right now we're requesting um, the total amount invoice so far. So we'll be expecting the 8 million um, reimbursed in. Right. So, but worst case scenario to show the impact on capacity showing what if we were not, we are not planning on carrying 25. Yeah, worst case scenario, you know, the only way we hit the worst case scenario is if FEMA and the state are not reimbursing the city as we expect. Yes. I mean, that is by far the worst case. Yes. Which? Total project cost is 35 million. Yep. So this is tw only 25 out of that. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're portraying an extreme, extreme worst case, which I can't even see a 1% chance of happening. So. Yes, so far right. numbers, uh, numbers are looking better. Uh, um, right away collection came a little under what we had originally estimated. Hopefully waterways will come under as well. Okay. And is there any progress on the bill that you mentioned the last time uh, that would uh, have them ha have them cover 90%? Yes, uh, Pill, uh, I think uh, last time we heard the bill uh, passed the House and it's at the Senate floor right now. Hopefully if it passes, we don't have to worry about the 5 million of a share. Okay. Questions? Yes, go ahead, Will. Oh, um, <laughs> Grant, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm feeling good about myself, Well, <laughs> Excuse me. Go ahead, Grant. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me see if I can summarize this, and I'm, I'm somewhat um, skewed by the materials provided for work session. The total principal we're seeking to be able to access is $40 million in this line of credit. We're only going to immediately draw upon 25 million of it, leaving 15 in reserve. That's grant speak. Is is that the the, the right way to interpret this? You actually have um, statutory authority after the hearing to do a, a line of credit up to 40 million. We're recommending that this initial one be 25. So you're not we're not planning at this point on having to tap into the other 15 million of capacity, but the city has already established that you have legal authority should we need it. When we put that number together, we hadn't yet received the bids for the waterways, which came in substantially lower than we expected. So it's just a matter of us getting honed in more on costs and understanding better when bills might be coming in and what we're actually going to need for cash flow. But in looking at what we actually would need, we wouldn't even anticipate unless FEMA is extremely slow that we would hit the 25 million point. So the actual line of credit is 25 million. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you have statutory authority. You are correct that we could go to 40. We would just do a second note for the other 15 in the unlikely eventuality that we needed it. Okay, so there's a little difference in terms of the plan of attack now that you realize versus what's what's uh, delineated in the uh, agenda memo. Correct. Okay. Just after um, once it's published in the paper, the city council, that's the number that gets put out for the public hearing. Okay, it, got it. And it, just so just so that we're all together on this, from the time work is completed in the field to the how much time is there until we submit those costs to FEMA and then they re reimburse them? What's that kind of general timeline we expect? If we submit everything that FEMA needs for review, we'll be expecting reimbursement within 120 days. Okay. We're still working on uh, the data for our project. 
we're I think we're close to submitting uh, the project. So a week we'll have completed data. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Emma? Renee and Colette, do you have any questions? No, thanks. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Thank you. The rest of the items under administrative services are not marked for discussion. Are there any items that any council member would like to discuss in particular? If not, we'll move on to engineering. Uh, also, no items are marked for discussion. Any items there to discuss? Okay, moving on to community development. F1 is not marked. Anyone don't want to discuss that item? Move on to F2, public hearing regarding a request to amend um, table six and table seven regarding permitted uses with the business regional and office services zoning districts. So as uh, as the <clears throat> staff report indicated, the, the city, when we uh, have been going through the rezoning and uh, uh, maps, we've we've heard from different groups of folks in different industries regarding uh, the actual ordinances relative to, well, if I'm zoned this district in the future, then these uses are something that we should be afforded. So there's been a lot of conversations about um, the actual zoning ordinance when we're talking about the maps, because really until the map becomes the zoning map, the ordinance really don't get looked at. So when we rezoned and created all those new districts, we put out all the public notices, we try to collect and get information, but until you tell somebody their property is gonna be rezoned from X to Y, they really don't really look at it. Now, the Bajorenson family, owns quite a bit of property around the community. Uh, they have been looking at our ordinances and, and walking through their land and they've made some, <clears throat> they made a request um, to amend the ordinances. And, you know, honestly, and, and you're gonna hear me say this as we go through, and I think if you went back to when we adopted the ordinances, I said it as well, we weren't gonna get this 100% correct the first go around. We're trying to talk about every use imaginable putting it into code. So uh, the Bajorenson family has brought forward a request to make some amendments to our ordinances. Um, we did agree with some of them and have, have made those changes uh, and, and edited the code. I know you received a very large 35 page document that outlined the changes, but really it comes down to providing for some uh, multifamily assisted living, nursing home, uh, more uh, group home type uses in some of the office service uh, district as well as the business, regional business district. You know, when you're sitting at a table and you're talking about it, it doesn't seem like those would be great fits, regional business district, which is like along a four lane highway or a nursing home or assisted living. However, if you, Think about when you drive around, you know, one of the, the newer market rate ones is right on 100. Um, a lot of the nursing homes uh, are along uh, uh, four lane divided roadways, Blair's Ferry Road in particular. Uh, you see a lot of hospice in those areas as well. So we did take a look at that and understanding kind of the situation that exists. We, we did agree and have, uh, proposed to make those tweaks within our within our code. And uh, honestly, I, I think they'll be good ones. Um, and we're, we're fully supportive of them. The Planning Commission reviewed it and also is fully supportive of that. I think Mr. Jensen was at that meeting, I believe, when we were talking about it. Um, and then we did also include in this amendment because we 
uh, did leave it out of our tables, which is somewhat embarrassing, I have to say, is uh, we had listed grocery stores and neighborhood grocery stores as uses, but we did not permit them in any district whatsoever. So uh, we thought it would be good to clean up our tables as we bring those forward as well. Um, I wasn't going to walk through all of this. You guys have got the information, and I, and I think it's pretty well laid out where the amendments were being proposed. I didn't know if you had any specific questions, but staff is comfortable, and the camp planning commission supported the amendments as being as identified. Questions? Go ahead, Steve. Uh, just a comment. Uh, if you really look at what's driving a lot of these changes, yeah, a lot of it is what might have been logical or made sense even two years ago for some of these districts. If we had done this two years ago, some of these might not have been in there. But if you look at where we are at today with the office space need and demand and future expectation, I think a lot of the entire market area, the market re arena for these two areas for BR and OS mm -hmm. uh, have completely changed just in the last year in, in 2020. So. You know, given that, I sat in on the meeting, listened to it, looked at the changes. Uh, again, I think they make a lot of sense. I think the requests they have are logical, uh, and PNZ supported it, and the staff did too. So I think that's one of the main drivers mm -hmm. from the reason all of a sudden I think we're talking about some of these changes. Whereas if we did this one or two years ago, we may not be talking about these, and we'd be talking about changes coming about. So I think it's all happening at the right time for the right reason. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, so uh, dovetailing into what Steve just commented on in terms of the, I would call it a change of expectation from two years ago, uh, what the market is really looking to. I would, I would uh, venture to say, we look forward two or three years. We're also gonna see um, some drive to have further amendments to what we are permitting and in fact there may be some things that would be contemplated that we're not even thinking of right now um, so I, I hope what we retain in our total system of uh, governance over our our, uh, our zoning uh, practices is the ability to retain that uh, ability to evolve with what the market does without it being prejudicial to landowners um if you catch what i'm trying to say there absolutely um i, I and i the second thing i would just say is i i uh, compliment uh the uh revision uh balloons on the table with some uh commentary to help uh, focus the review of it i thanks so much that's helpful dave does a very nice job in preparing the staff reports i gotta give him credit oh yeah Other questions? Okay, F4, Tom. Rachel, is there a is there an illustration on the deck? So on Thursday there'll be a public hearing regarding the request to rezone. Uh, property and also amend the conference of plan um, as indicated in the agenda to provide the opportunity for a multifamily uh, development uh, on the site of the uh, existing can you say existing now YMCA still there <laughs> it's still there so the existing YMCA uh, uh, building uh, on the corner of 31st and 10th Ave uh, the 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 property is currently set up for a quasi government facility. So, um, you know, the, the zoning and the land use are really not in line. Um, so the proposed changes do uh, come in line with providing the opportunity for multifamily development. Um, you know, multifamily development uh, is uh, a transitional use. It can be used between commercial, high density, uh, residential and single family. And I think this is a, a great example of being able to provide for some infill redevelopment. Uh, the density is higher than it is to the west and higher than it is to the north, but I believe that the way the design is being proposed, it transitions well to all of the adjacent properties. 
it it even does provide some green space behind the building that I think is uh, you can see in the illustration here um, is is substantial. Uh, when you're considering adding 147 units to the site, you do want to have some green space, and, and they are affording for that. So on Thursday, there'll be the public hearing on the rezoning and the comprehensive plan amendment, and then also a discussion regarding the preliminary site development plan. Uh, staff laid out a pretty uh, lengthy staff report regarding this. There's been a lot of conversations back and forth. I wasn't planning to walk through all of the review uh, processes that we went through. Uh, one of the things that we've changed, and I hope you had the opportunity to see it in the staff report, is we're really relating our proposed changes back to our comp plan. In the past, I don't think we were great at that, and we really changed that, and the staff report lays out what the goals of the residential districts are, and it really provides us an ability to uh, compare what's being proposed to those goals and really uh, supports that. So I think uh, uh, confidently staff is supportive. I think the commission was supportive as well, and uh, look forward to seeing this uh, project come forward. Uh, I think the public hearing on Thursday I'm a little concerned um, that we didn't get a lot of public comment at Planning Commission. Um, and there's a really diverse community around this area. There's uh, some senior housing, uh, what I would consider senior housing. There's a lot of condos to the north. And uh, there was a petition filed. I think 50 residents signed a petition against this. Um, so I don't know if we're going to get a lot of uh, conversation from the Zoom meeting. But uh, you know, we we've received the petition, but we haven't received much correspondence outside of that. Um, and I think uh, I, I really don't know how to resolve that issue, to be honest with you. But um, from a staff perspective and planning commission perspective, certainly is support for the project. So um, we'll see what happens on Thursday. But okay, I'm going to let Mayor Pro Tem handle the discussion on this. Yeah, I think I again I sat in on that. PNZ meeting and it was a three hour meeting that night. So it was really long for you guys. But I think what I'd what I would ask you to do to resolve some of those petition issues and questions is when I looked at it again this morning, you know, they kind of cited four areas or four areas of concern. And if we could address those when we have the public hearing on Thursday, mm -hmm. one was uh, water runoff issues in the area, water pressure traffic issue and noise issue. Yep. So, and again, I've heard different comments and aspects about that. So I think if we address those as part of our public hearing, uh, I mean, the one petition that had 50 signatures, they just went and got everybody's signature on Sunburst Avenue from 31st Street clear down to 35th Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just went, took the entire street, even though some of those places are, you know, four blocks away. Uh, that's fine. I understand that. But if I looked at what was underlying, you know, those are the four issues of all of the uh, petitions that I think we need to talk about during the public hearing. Um, the, the, the one aspect we're, we're talking about the public hearing, but we're really going to be also talking about the site development. That's not marked for discussion. The one aspect of that that I would like to have discussed, or I will have discussed when we talked about the site development plan. And that is for this entire development, there are two driveways out of this mm -hmm. and both of them enter on 31st Street. Uh, I'm surprised I did not hear any discussion when traffic was being talked about, about can this be modified or adjusted so that you have one on 31st and maybe one coming off of 10th Avenue. Yeah. Uh, I think that can be done relatively easy by just kind of shoving everything down and moving uh, a little bit of the buildings uh, without changing uh, the number of units. Uh, to me, this, this project has good setbacks from the street, uh, more than normal, uh, a lot of green space on the Northeast corner. So uh, again, I think there's some really good things about it, but I think there's those four areas, if we can address those, comment on those, so that everybody that had those petitions uh, understands how those are being taken care of. We can I do think, that. I Absolutely. think that will, people who are listening in, I don't know how many will be listening in Thursday. Mm -hmm. Hopefully there'll be quite a few more listening in. Uh, so we don't know what to expect, but if we take care of those right up front, maybe that'll address some of their 
concerns. I believe from a, the planning commission meeting, there was also a concern with regard to traffic and the desire to have a traffic study done. Right. <clears throat> I can uh, check with Mike. I know he's on the call, but um, between now and Thursday and also get an update on that situation as well. I know that just immediately following that meeting, we already figured we better get that accomplished. So uh, we did reach out and ask them to provide some traffic information as well. So I'll get an update on that as well. And there's a little traffic information in one of the pages that is part of the packet here. Yeah. I mean, they provided an extensive mm -hmm. amount of information yep. uh, on this project. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff here to, Hey, you gotta, you gotta go through it a couple of times to really, uh, I think, understand what is all here, what's going on, how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that more of that obviously on Thursday. So before we move on, Grant, question. Yeah, were there any dissenters uh, on the Planning and Zoning Commission for the regarding this project? You know, that was a long meeting. I don't think there were any. Okay. I don't recall any. That, that that's fine. If, yeah. yeah. If, Double check on that, Tom. But yeah, I will definitely. I think it was unanimous, if I recall. So I, I do agree uh, with Steve's assessment of the principal themes that the, uh, that the uh, neighborhood residents uh, were concerned about. There was one other one that I think was brought out in an individual letter uh, by a retired couple was um, the possibility, the potential of instead of having three buildings, moving it down, downgrading it to two. And I don't know that that you know, from a construction standpoint, site development standpoint, I don't know if that's logical or not. I'm just wondering as we examine the other base level concerns that the the respondents had, uh, if that's something that should also be factored into the overall evaluation as this gets finalized. Because I, I think their their concern, if I read the letter right, uh, was uh, 147 units. That's a, that's a that's a sizable number of people, and hence drives the traffic volumes, et cetera. What if it is just uh, downgraded a bit in terms of total uh, site occupancy? Yeah, I, I do know that the the developers are trying to create that happy medium between. Uh, cost effectiveness and return on investment and such, uh, but I, I can ask the question certainly. Well, I, if I should just just to footnote my comment, uh, I, I think maybe another review of the the comments that were received and how perverse how pervasive that theme is of reducing the footprint of the total uh, construction. If if that it warrants any treatment. I guess I just want to make sure we've touched that stone. I'm here. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Renee Colette, do you have any comments or questions before we move on? No, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good too. Thank you. All right. So yeah, this will have, I'm sure a lot more discussion on Thursday. All right. We'll move the meeting Thanks. back to the mayor. Okay. So that should, Cover through F7, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. And then uh, next item is F8. That's correct. <clears throat> so, so F8 is the the long-awaited first phase of rezoning the community, and this is addressing Ward Two. Um, and the I, I hope everybody got a chance to get your hard copies. We got larger copies, so you can take a look at the differences. Um, in all fairness, we started with this district primarily because it was the easy district. Um, it's primarily residential. There weren't a lot of changes. Um, there may be some non-conforming structures created here and there, but it's primarily due to some setbacks, but we're also cleaning up some setbacks. So it's really hard to make everything fit into this perfect little um, box and, and appease everybody. I think in this area, we have done probably the best job we could <clears throat> to, to do that. Um, and uh, we've, we've not had a lot of input or uh, uh, I shouldn't say input. We ha we've had input, but we haven't had a lot of uh, folks contact us about changes or, or questions or comments related to the proposed rezoning. In this day and age, it is very difficult to get public comment on something as massive as this. Usually it's easier if you're talking about one specific parcel and you can notify the 
adjacent property owners. To be honest, we obviously did not send a notice to every property owner or every parcel owner as this relates. Um, we did reach out to the Marion Times and tried to get some coverage on that. I have to be honest, I didn't see if it was covered or not in the, in the, in the <clears throat> but we did, we did talk to the Marion Times about that. Pretty sure it was. What was it? I didn't, I didn't happen to get to catch it or not. And so we're, <clears throat> we're hopeful that uh, if there are folks that have questions or comments, they'll reach out to us and the public hearing on Thursday, they could provide some comments on that. Um, so I didn't know if you had any specific questions. Is this, I mean, this we could, I could go on and do a great deal of detail as it relates to this, but uh, honestly, with the amount of residential that we're really touching, it really doesn't change a lot. As a matter of fact, it probably cleans up more of the traditional areas. I think I broached it before when we were setting the date that, you know, where the, the homes were located closer than 25 feet to the property line and they create neighborhoods that were built in that manner uh, north of 10th uh, Avenue. Um, if they get uh, tore down, they have to maintain a 25 foot setback, which requires them to be built behind the property or behind the front yard lines of most of the other homes. So I think we're cleaning up uh, some of those neighborhoods in a much better fashion than we would, would have been if we saw redevelopment on its own. So any, any questions specifically to this? Questions? So this will be on the agenda for approval. Uh, yes. Any questions at this time? Your Honor. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, not a question, but a comment. Um, Tom, I just, as I've become familiar with this, I remember going to one of the uh, community meetings that was done, what, uh, a year ago, October? Something like that. Yeah, when this was being primarily introduced and I just applaud the hard work that you all have uh, been making on this and um, then to have it further compl uh, complicated by breaking it down into wards just because we have to do it in bite sized chunks given our situation right now. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say uh, this is this is difficult work getting a lot of comments I am sure from uh, stakeholders uh, but again thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I and it, <clears throat> to that point, Dave and Nicole in the office have been very instrumental in this. I I have to give them a lot of the credit in this regard. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I, I believe the so it is a ordinance to adopt the map. So there'll be, there'll be three readings of it too. So you know I would just ask that if if this it's the press or we get more information in the public hearing um, if there is the opportunity for folks that come forward afterwards understanding the public hearing is closed if there's an opportunity to provide some le leniency on public comment at those times that'd be great i think it's just one of those things that it's difficult to get the word out right now so if there's the ability for folks to comment that'd be great if they were allowed to do so at the second or third reading Any comments or questions for Tom on this item before we move on? Okay, that brings us to F10 through 13, which are not marked for discussion. Any of those items of, of uh, particular concern to anyone? We got the bridge in there. I see that. Before. <laughs> Good deal. So we'll count our, on our uh, representatives to the MPO to push for some funding there. <laughs> okay, um, if there are no comments on those, we'll move on to F14, resolution approving a contract for appraisal services for the CMAR trail project. So no, <clears throat> item number 14 and 15 are contracts for appraisal services related to uh, some of the property uh, within the CMAR trail project, particularly south of 100. Uh, we obviously uh, need to acquire some property down through there. And um, I just want to point out that we're, we're working through that process and, you know, 
uh, we're, we're following the appropriate uh, uh, acquisition procedures. We're getting an appraisal and then a and, uh, review appraisal for the properties. So those two uh, um, contracts are on the agenda for approval. So okay. questions on those. Okay, F-16. Uh, F-16. <clears throat> so as the council is well aware, uh, we're moving forward with our streetscape design services, RDG. Uh, I, I think uh, staff uh, behind me and those online would support that RDG has been doing a fantastic job with this and the committee members as well. Uh, their graphics and a way to illustrate the streetscape project has been uh, fantastic and it really provides us a good picture of what's going on, I believe. Um, if the council recalls, we started down the road of a conversation about the plaza at the same time as we did the streetscape. And one of the things that came out of the discussion of the streetscape was 11th Street North of 7th Avenue. Um, I think when we started this process several years ago and trying to decide what the scope of the streetscape would be, 11th Street wasn't in the, what I would say, the, the the entertainment district of Marion as it is now. Um, and it was starting, but I think it's really become quite the area to be on a regular basis, both retail and, and nightlife wise. I think 10th Street's the same way with the new restaurants and such as well. But um, as we started down the road, we started looking at the details of the streetscape and we realized that we really didn't put 11th Street in the streetscape plan. We were doing you know, 7th Avenue between essentially 9th Street and 12th Street, 10th Street, we needed to connect with 6th Street. But once we got looking at it in more detail, we realized that we probably better address 11th Street considering all the excitement that's been garnered in that area recently. So as we went through the master plan and plaza updates, these were kind of the options for um, development of, of 11th Street North of 10th or yeah, 11th Street North of 7th that came out of the master plan. You can see uh, phase one is really on the right, which was developed the uh, south side of the alley down to 7th. And then uh, option two or future options could be uh, developing a full plaza all the way to 8th Avenue. So when this went to the committee, there was a lot of excitement for seeing the redevelopment in, the, in this area. But then there was a little bit of a letdown when we said, well, this is a future phase. And so we got to looking at it and, and honestly, it just doesn't make any sense not to do a portion of, of this area with the streetscape project. And so, you know, it wasn't a part of the original scope of work. So we worked with RDG and asked that they would provide us some conceptual uh, illustrations of how that could come together and then also give us a, a cost estimate for additional design services related to this area. Um, Anderson Bogart was pretty confident that they could work that design within their contract. Um, uh, Mike might be able to comment on that as well. If there's questions, but nonetheless, we, we took and we got a, a contract for services 54,570 for taking this portion, the South, the alley South to seventh um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I believe the design was from 8th to 7th uh, to preliminary and final construction and then also working in the final design for some of the uh, specific artistic treatments along the 7th Avenue corridor, some of the monuments. So that's the contract that's ahead of us uh, or that's before the council this evening. If you go to the next slide, you can see really what they're taking is the concept um, from the master plan to really design development. And if you go to the next slide, please, you can see uh, 7th Avenue is on the on the left, 8th Avenue would be on the right. And really we're taking, talking about taking that and turning it from concept to design, preliminary design, final design um, of that area, and then incorporating that into the development and, and construction timeline as the streetscape. So there's, there's two good benefits. We're doing it one time, we'll get the project complete, and then we, we won't have it tore up, you know, a second season. So the idea is to be able to get this under design so that we can let the project all as one and move it forward uh, in the spring. And go to the next slide, please. 
you can see that's a detail. At this point, we're really looking at constructing south of the alley with the initial phase. Um, so you can see you'd, you'd incorporate uh, the connectiveness on the right side of the screen between the alley on the west to the east through that, that little bit of a treatment. And then uh, uh, obviously we'd then continue the, the plaza down to the streetscape on seven. If you go to the next slide. This part would, uh, would be designed, but we would uh, uh, delay the construction of that. Obviously there's a great deal of parking in this area. We'd want some time to see how redevelopment occurs in that area because we do think some redevelopment will occur. And uh, just, we, we hate to take the entire core area here and tear it up at one time. So that'll be a future, future phase. Next slide. And then this is a really, just a fantastic perspective of what that could look like um, upon completion. And, you know, the contracts on the, on the agenda for, for the council's consideration, this is, this is really getting into the, the meat of what this area could look like. Um, and it's pretty exciting to see, see come together. So with that, if there's any questions, I, I'll show you some other pictures in the, on the next in the streetscape presentation that there's like $10,000 in that scope of work that was specific to the architectural treatments of some of the uh, monument and, and signage. I can show you pictures of that stuff as well. So any questions on that? So before we move on to the streetscape, any questions on this? Go ahead. Well, just from the standpoint of project integration and, and scope integration, I, I think this makes a lot of sense. I think we all know that uh, going north on 11th is, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, potential um, trip elements there. And so thinking about how to get this all rectified in, uh, in what I'm hearing is, is two uh, project components, that which is immediately adjacent to 7th Avenue and then the second piece, which is on the north end. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, just, it just takes care of a lot of situations and from an aesthetic standpoint of what we're trying to do in the uptown, it just, it really is a solid integration. So I really support this if it can be done within uh, knowing scope and funding boundaries. What, what, um... What's the timeline in terms of construction, like disruption to those businesses, that kind of? So we'd, we'd like to be uh, constructing this next summer. But what is, is there a timeline of how long it would take to, or you don't know that Probably at this point? It's, I mean, is it? Yeah, I, I'll have more of that, but it'd months, be about a year. Months. Yeah, it'd be about a year. It'd be a year to get it done? Mm -hmm. Wow. Because we're talking 8th to 12th. Um, Mike, so weird when he's not in the room. <laughs> Barcolo is on the call, I'm sure, somewhere, and he could probably speak to that. Oh, well, you're talking about the streetscape. Yeah. And this would be part of that. Correct. This isn't done separately. It's done no, as part of that whole done project. Now, what this does do, and I think it's just important to note, is the plaza conversation. There'll be portions of the plaza that may be accomplished with, with redevelopment of the mall site, but... Um, we would probably, well, we would need to come back the following year and, and work towards the plaza. And of course, we've got some funding and grant opportunities for the plaza as well. So that would be a, mm -hmm. a project that would come probably a year after the streetscape in 11th Street. So this is where the alley, the artway is gonna become very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes. As uh, for access to businesses. Yep. <clears throat> Um, okay, other questions? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Tom, so when we move forward, when we're talking about streetscape and the plaza projects, uh, is 11th Street between 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue, is that under the umbrella of the plaza project? That, that is. That is part that of is, that. Yep. So when we talk about that project, that'll all be encompassing with that. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, um, and right now, there's a lot of moving pieces uh, and a lot of timelines that we're trying to kind of put, put together. Um, so we just received um, the uh, proposed development of the mall site. It's being reviewed in house, you know, and that project kind of bleeds into the plaza project. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some conversations about how that works together as well. Sure. There'll probably be some 
encroachment agreements and conversations about those two projects melding together. Um, you know, the, cr the critical piece for the mall project is that we get the streetscape in front of that project right. accomplished when they're starting to open. Um, that's just a very, those that went up to Waterloo and, and, and had the opportunity to walk around and talk with the developer up there, um, that was critical to his project success was being able to have that. So that's why we are, you know, we're moving pretty quick, I would say from a city perspective on design development and letting the project, but we're, we're trying to work together as a team to make this all come together in a great, it's gonna be a great project. Oh, I think, it's, about I think it's extremely exciting to see all of these major projects with the streetscape, the plaza, and, and the mall project all kind of happening at the same time and being able to be coordinated yeah, uh, in the in the correct manner. So a lot of times you don't have that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're very fortunate that this is all going to be uh, kind of under one scope, yep. so to speak, so that everything can kind of uh, work together. So this is why I think it makes sense, as uh, as Grant said, to do that yeah. project. Yeah. Oh, at the same time, you're going to go through the disruption of the businesses. Yep. You only want to do it one time. Yeah. We don't want to have to, you know, continually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, disrupt them and cause them uh, the inconvenience. So uh, to just get it all done at the same time is a, it's a, I think it's very smart. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Will. So you might be covering this in your next presentation, but so it's eight to 12 and you're saying a year, I assume you're going to have phases in there. So it won't be from eight to 12. It's not going to be tore up the entire time for one whole year. Correct. That's that's correct. Do you know yep. time frames on phases that might be chiming in? Um, not not at the not at the moment. I don't have that stuff readily available. I think we're still trying to plan for that because there's and and uh, there's other projects in the area that are going to help dictate some of that. You know, the 10th Street, 10th and Central, is going to be the roundabout tore up. So there's going to have to coordinate when that activity is going on. Sure. So so there this this is going to be a pretty. Uh, uh, well thought out and, and orchestrated <laughs> construction time yeah. frame. And I, so I, I, I don't have any, one thing I will say, and, and Mike can chime in on this, because I'm going to start talking about utilities and underground stuff, which I'm extremely knowledgeable of. <laughs> um, <laughs> the utilities, you know, you want to build them from the top or the bottom to the top. And so, you know, really the, the project needs to start, you know, at the eighth, between eighth and ninth and connectivity and then bring it up to the top of 10th street or of uh, 7th avenue so um timing that with the 10th street connect or 10th street and central roundabout is going to be really really critical so and it's going to include the plaza area both north and south of on 10th street from 7th to 8th and 6th those two legs are going to get reconstructed yeah, yeah. There, there's 12 none of 12th is getting redone correct uh 12th uh, yes, twelfth. Uh, uh, we'll we'll tie into the uh, with the building project. Yep, but not well, the street. Well, city project though. So we're but, trying to actually time access to that parking lot during this whole thing as well. But that won't be part of the streetscape. Yep. Correct. Yep. No, it will be. It will be twelfth yes. to the Five. north. Twelfth <clears throat> to the south. Between <laughs> six and seven, it's right here. Will be part of the streetscape. Yes. Okay. But not to the north. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, if, can you go to the first slide in the, oh, yeah, we, we're skipping Mike. That's just a precursor to what you have to come, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the constraints, um, uh, just so you can see uh, what we're talking about. The, this isn't the, the best drawing to illustrate it, but it was the only one I had on a quickly, so you can see. Um, uh, 9th Street, uh, where the highlighted intersection to the west is kind of the finishing the ski streetscape out, out to the roundabout. And if you go east of 9th Street, you're going to go all the way to 12th. You can see we do a little, we go a little bit about to the alley north and alongside the Tomasos. And then we, we uh, stub back into where the new street was constructed with 6th Avenue along the south side um, of 7th on 12th Street. Um, and then obviously you can see where we we did not include originally in the scope of work that 11th street piece between the um between 10th and 12th mm -hmm. so this this is the kind of drawing where we said 
huh, that might not make people very happy. <laughs> um, you know, it's a big project, so you just you, you kind of lose sight of the um, of the thing. So, okay. Other questions for Tom on this? Okay. Do you want to move on to the streetscape? Yep. So, first slide of the streetscape. So the project uh, outlined here, I, you know, there's a, I just kind of wanted to give a little update on where we are. We're, we're really moving towards finalizing the, the streetscape plans, the construction plans. Um, you can see the area that we just talked about is, is highlighted as kind of where we're at. Uh, less 11th street, <laughs> the uh, engineers and the planners are diligently working to get those plans caught up to these plans. Um, so we can go to the next step uh, slide there. Um, so just highlighting, you know, the, the, the area that we're going to see the most treatments are between 10th and 12th and along 7th. You know, you can kind of see, and I, and I think I may have showed some of these illustrations to the council. I know the committee's seen these, but I don't, I honestly don't know if I've showed it to the entire council. You can see this is the treatment in the, in the block 7th Avenue um, between uh, uh, 10th and 11th. And so it kind of is going to be mimicked on the other side of 11th as well. Go to the next slide. Uh, so we're going to have some pole spacings, uh, new street lights. Uh, you can see the the uh, <clears throat> there's several different options for lighting, and I think this is going to be a critical piece to this project. I think it's going to be fantastic. On the north side, we got shorter poles that are more pedestrian oriented, so that uh, we don't have poles up into the second story windows uh, for residential redevelopment. Uh, they're going to be the lighting is going to be focused downwardly onto the sidewalk. Those are the, the poles identified as B. Uh, on C, we're gonna have uh, a little taller pole structure, um, but you can see they're gonna um, provide some uh, lighting arms similar to what we have on sixth. And uh, the LEDs will uh, be in a, in a fashion that they can cover the sidewalk and the street at the same time. So we're gonna have pedestrian lighting on the north. And then there was over, uh, the, the pole structures and the overhanging lights will be able to cover both the street and the pedestrian way. One thing you will notice on the pole structures that on the south side, they're taller. And the idea is that you can see there's some lighting fixtures on the north, on the very top of those. The lighting is like during events um, such as, you know, the peppermint walk or anything that's going on in the wintertime of town, because we're really trying to make this a seasonal use. Those lights can be turned on and really create a, a, a a, a really, pardon the pun, but a lighted atmosphere in the uptown when, you know, it gets dark so early. So that's the reason those poles are a little bit taller. They were originally proposed at like 55 feet, but now we're, they're, they're, they're back down trying to keep uh, very similar to the, the height of the buildings on the north side so they don't seem too overbearing. But there'll be poles like that on between 10th and 12th, so they can really light that up. The whole idea on the streetscape is to make it that that plaza that can be shut down on a Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, whenever, and really create a walkable experience. Not, the, uh, what's that? I'm not trying to be funny, but in the meantime, what would it take to get the lights that are currently there working? Because they're not working in that area. Yeah, it's you know, really, I noticed that right. It's before. really dark in that block. But anyway, that might be yeah. a discussion for another time. But <laughs> I, I just, thought that I, was just a temporary. I saw that before Thanksgiving. Well, the lights aren't working, so I don't. But we can talk about that. But I just wanted to. Just, yeah, no, that's the. Yeah. Um, and then finally, and I think this, I don't know why. Maybe it's just me, but I thought this was a really cool tribute to the past. E, uh, they call this lighting system a cantonary system, and if anybody's seen uh, the. Uh, historical photo, it's like a panoramic photo of that intersection from like the 1800s. There was a, a light fixture that's hung right in the middle, like a big old light bulb um, way back in the 1800s. And this cantonary system, as, as they call it, is gonna crisscross at the intersection. It'll be out of the way of passing vehicles and above the requirements of, of semi-tractor trailers and such, so nothing will tear them out. But, um, we'll provide a highlighted intersection there in the, in the block in the, between the two blocks and it'll really make a connection between the 11th Street Plaza and then the Central Plaza and in the park area and really highlight that intersection for pedestrian crossings as well. 
I think that's a really cool tribute to kind of the past. So this is just a perspective showing how that lighting system works. Um, you can see that um, you got uh, the the light the light on the front, the high, the taller lighting. I don't think that we went with the pedestrian lighting. I think the front cobra, the, the overhead light was going to pass through and, and actually project onto the sidewalk. I think they determined they could do that. And then you can see from a scale perspective how the uh, pedestrian lighting is, is really trying to move away from impeding into the second story windows to, to not affect uh, upper story redevelopment. One of the things that we, we do foresee coming out of the conversation is going to be uh, up lighting on the buildings. So that's something we're hoping to be able to work with building owners on as well. So this is just a, a good perspective of looking down uh, 7th Avenue. You can see uh, the different lighting. And then uh, I wanna point out right now and then we can talk about it in a minute, uh, the pavement treatments. Um, and maybe you can go to the next slide too. So from a pavement perspective, there's been a lot of conversation about brick. I can't believe how many years of my career I've talked about brick. Um, <laughs> clay brick, concrete brick, and reclaimed brick is the most recent conversation. So you can see there's different patterns being proposed within the project. Right now it's being scoped and planned uh, and engineered for PCC and the dry vials uh, and then unit pavers. Uh, I think right now it's been talked about as concrete pavers in the parking for durability. Clay pavers behind the curb to match and kind of tie into the 6th Avenue uh, area. Uh, B and C identified in the crosswalk would be some sort of unit pavers. However, this, this illustration doesn't show it. There would need to be a, a concrete center uh, to this a colored concrete. We'd work it into the design um, because of uh, recent uh, rulings, uh, you, you have to provide ADA and uh, crosswalks, which comply with ADA. They can't be brick, they gotta be uh, smooth concrete. So we've worked that into the design and the, and the details. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. The, the uh, one thing that is interesting, and I'm just highlighting, and I don't have a really good perspective in this illustration, is that we're going to no curbs. So when you go to a, it's a plaza street. I know we talked about it at, at length. Uh, I think more of as a desire uh, when we started this project, but it really did come together. And so the project's being designed to be curbless. So at night, on weekends, um, if you have a stroller or your children, if you ever been to a, an event where it's, they, they block off the street, you see people trip all the time because they don't even think about the curb being there. So I think this would be a really, really neat amenity for the area and really lend itself to be a great plaza space outside of the other plazas being created. This is just showing a little detail um, on, on how that, I think it's interesting to talk about E. Um, so there would be a, a gutter line in the, in the street so the water would, would shed and uh, kind of get out of the way and you won't have that gutter. Um, if you, I shouldn't say gutter, but the curb line in a lot of areas where the water will sit on the edge, this is kind of going to be uh, provided so it would 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 flow to that that edge line and not be gathered at the corners. I know on 11th Street we have a couple areas where uh, water stands pretty significantly uh, at the gutter line. So there's no traditional curb, right? Nope. There will be some raised areas. Um, you can see on the edge of the page there where the planter boxes would be. It provides a little bit of a barrier. Uh, one thing you'll see probably as well will be where the uh, street lighting is. You'll have a further uh, raised concrete base than you would normally because you don't want cars hitting. You know, if they do go over, you don't want them to hit the light pole and knock them over. So there'll be some, there's just some design considerations that come with that proposal. Next slide, Sarah. So just another perspective, kind of putting it all together and you can kind of see the, um, there's a proposal for the street furnishings would be located. And then uh, the yellow areas kind of highlight some of the design or upscaled markers that are being proposed. You can see the one that I think is pretty exciting is one that would identify the entryway into uh, the 
the artway uh, between in the middle of the block there. It's also showing uh, the stage uh, location proposed in the in the plaza area on the south side. Thanks. So these are just some of the concepts that have been um, put together for some of the the the, the markers uh, architecturally. Uh, these are not finalized, but this is kind of some of the temporary the the uh, initial design being put together. If you go to the next phase, Cheryl, one of the things that's really been exciting and, and kind of different about the project is really trying to bring that winter atmosphere into the streetscape, which has caused us to really need to take a look at how lighting is used. And so you can see there's different treatments of lighting within the monuments that are being proposed, as well as some on the street uh, shadow boxing. You can see where it says Uptown Marion in the leaf. That doesn't have to be the design, but in the wintertime, um, for certain events, you could turn on the lights that may have a pattern or artistic uh, way to just kind of make your walk through the uptown a lot more pleasurable um, using something other than lighting or signage. So it's this, the shadows, it's kind of an interesting way to kind of portray the uptown. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of putting it all together, just a perspective of what it looks like during the day. You can see the monument signs on the on the north side. If you go to the next slide, kind of gives you a perspective of what happens at night when they're lit up. And then next slide, Daryl. So there's, there's that gateway piece. It's kind of just identifying the entrance into the art art artway um, from seventh at night. Next slide, Carol. And so this is just another perspective looking west down 7th Avenue. Um, and I think there's a night, there you go. Um, so this is a good slide. I think there might be more slides, but we could, this might, this is the last one. Perfect. Um, so, you know, I really wanted to just give a little update where we're at. I don't think we've talked in a while about this. Um, these are just some uh, drawings that have been uh, provided to us by RDG. As we come forward with the final design, I think I'll probably have RDG do this presentation as the designer. I just wanted to give the council a little bit of an update. There are three kind of issues that are out there um, that we're kind of grappling with at this time. And uh, outside of these three issues, I think we're sitting pretty good. Um, one is the center uh, drive aisle of the street. Um, so we're the way it's proposed, it's PCC, so it's just concrete. One of the questions has been brought forward a, a, again is the the idea of a brick uh, paver in the streetway. Um, something different than what we've talked about for six, because I think I think folks are a little uh, uh, jaded with what we have in Sixth Avenue. The clay pavers just haven't really done what I think everybody envisioned them to do. Um, and then there's the black markings and such. But one, 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 one paver that has come back as a conversation piece is reclaimed brick. Um, you know, we're talking about the most historic portion of the community. Uh, the north portion of 7th Avenue is our, is our historic commercial district. Um, we do everything we can to preserve that district and those buildings. We're gonna talk about another way to do that here in a second as number two, but uh, so the conversation really is, is there support to at least looking at reclaimed brick for that surfacing in the parking and in the drive aisles for that portion of seventh between 10th and 12th. Um, pricing wise, it's about the same as a, as a unit paver, a little bit less actually, but uh, we've, we've sourced some that are local or they're Iowa City, so they're local. And uh, we've got some uh, conversations going. We could draw up some and provide some cost estimates and illustrations to illustrate it within the context of this. But I just feel like, and I think the committee uh, and internal staff would support the conversation, at least having and bringing it forward. Uh, from a maintenance perspective, uh, one of the things that's been uh, brought forward by, by Ryan um, is that the durability is there because these bricks are the bricks that we're seeing in our streets currently that have been there for 
100 plus years. And so that's, I think, been the major question with uh, the streets that we've talked about or Sixth Avenue and the clay pavers that we've seen done more recently. So that's one of the issues that the that the group is kind of, we need, we need to get to some resolve too. And I think we'd like to have the conversation about reclaimed brick again. Um, so you don't have to answer me 100% now, but just so there's an awareness that that's a question that's been, that's being uh, discussed. Uh, secondly, and it goes back to preservation. As we continue down the road to, of this project, you can see we're gonna make a, a substantial investment in the streetscape, hardscape, and, uh, and just the aesthetic treatments in this area. There's gonna be a lot of infrastructure. We're talking about conduit, wiring. Uh, there's been talk of um, piping, the ability to have uh, music piped into the area. So that's just another conduit piece. So we don't really wanna see the area tore up one year later because there's a development proposal that comes forward for a building and that needs to be sprinklered. So water service to the buildings that would um, accept and be able to handle sprinkler systems uh, in the uptown is, is, is critical. Um, and we feel like with the project, we should be moving forward with ensuring that that water service line is provided to all the buildings. This is not a cheap venture, estimated about $15,000 per building it'd likely be a six inch line to the two story buildings to provide for that sprinkler system. So as we work through the cost and conversation on cost, I think one of the things we're gonna have to talk through is how that, how that gets paid. And that may be um, uh, asking the building owners to, to, to step into the arena of helping and assisting with that, um, that, um, that process. So that's another, piece that I think we're, we're going to need to be talking with. I know we're going to uh, set up some conversations with building owners through the uptown district. And, and so that'll be a piece that I think we'll, we'll also have to have a conversation about. And then uh, the third piece, and I think the council is pretty much aware of this one was the ADA improvements. I think we, we voiced at a meeting or maybe it was the steering committee that as we go through this uh, streetscape design process, we're going to be uh, having to address uh, deficiencies um, in ADA accessibility. Some of the building, some of the buildings we just can't fix. I mean, it's just impossible to to fix the situation. Others we can with some uh, with some improvements. And uh, I think we're uh, around the two fifty to three hundred thousand dollar mark on what it's going to cost to make all of those improvements. So. When you start adding some of those costs up that are very specific to property owners, um, realizing it does impact a private property owner and we do these projects, the question is, 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 is where is the line between what the city pays for and what the building owners are responsible for or what uh, we can work with them on to accommodate these types of improvements. So I think that's just, I just wanna be very upfront with the council and, and let you guys know, these are some, some conversations and they're, What's that say? They say in leadership, if you, if you can, if you can handle the tough conversations, you're gonna, you're really gonna be able to exceed, uh, um, excel. Well, <laughs> we got some tough conversations ahead of us, I think, on on these on these projects. And I think those are the three. Obviously, the first one is more of a council conversation and maintenance issue, but the the last two, we're talking about quite a bit of money uh, as it relates to the design of the project. So. Well, but they may be tied together because I mean, I think any cost savings that you might be able to achieve on what kind of material you use on the road may be able to be applied towards these other mm -hmm. important elements, which is, you know, accessibility and all that. And, mm -hmm. and the, uh, yep. um, you know, on the issue of, of reclaimed brick, I think what would be helpful, at least for me, is if we were able to see what the cost difference, estimated cost difference is of putting the brick versus concrete in the street, in the you know driving portion of the street versus only, you know, maybe using it on the parking areas. Um, and what is the long-term cost savings? I mean, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, how long is that concrete street going to last and, how, and we have to replace it or pave it or whatever, resurface it. What is the cost savings of having brick if there is any, uh, if you're saying it's going to be there for a hundred years? Or, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think some of those things, I mean, to me would be yep. kind of, kind of important. I think, you know, I've made it clear that anything like sixth Avenue, I just think is a waste of money. Uh, I don't think we got the, aesthetic element that we wanted from it. I think it looks like a asphalt street right now. Um, and I think there's a, quite a bit of, from what I understand, quite a bit of cost savings by not having brick. Um, but if you, you know, if there's some long-term cost savings, maybe we should know about that um, with maintenance and resurfacing and that kind of stuff, so. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just, um... Your Honor, just to um, expand on that thought, Tom, as I looked at this total presentation, I really, you know, I like the visual concept and, and what's being conveyed here. Um, I guess one of the things, whether it be the, I forget what you call the, the lighted artistic structures that border the, the Seventh Avenue, whether it be brick, concrete, asphalt for the roadway, I think we really need to think about life cycle costs relative to maintenance. Mm -hmm. And is there a native advantage to any one approach that needs to be factored into the decision calculus? Um, uh, so I guess, you know, I'm sure Ryan's got opinions about, um, you know, what the life cycle cost is for brick. <laughs> and we ex direct experience with it. But that I think those kinds of considerations ought to be an input to final uh, construction considerations. One, one thing in this, I'm glad you have this diagram here, this walkway that goes from, I guess it would be Plaza South to Plaza North, <laughs> um, <laughs> is wide open for a uh, car to turn into the plaza. And so I would expect, or it would at least anticipate that there is some kind of traffic barrier that doesn't impede uh, handicapped or pedestrian uh, utilization of that walkway, but certainly is an impediment to a vehicle turning in there. And I, I think about that if there's a crowd of people standing on the sidewalk having a conversation, and for some reason, uh, for some occurrence, like somebody has a medical condition that all of a sudden causes a car to swerve into into that area that it is prevented from hitting uh, pedestrians. Yep, good point. To add to that too, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Will. Uh, you could easily, someone thinks diagonal parking and then more diagonal parking right at the cross. And then my thought too was where the crosswalk is um, with no curbs. When you're pulling into the south side, if there's a barrier at each stall, so you don't mm -hmm. go too far and into the sidewalk. Okay, Randy. Oh, th <clears throat> thank you. I I look at these as well, and I get excited about <clears throat> you know the streets and the surfaces and so forth. But it also gives me the opportunity to come back and kind of bring up that um, enforcing our weight limits um, on our heavy trucks. You know, this is a this is exactly why I think we should be enforcing those things because I think part of these uh, weight permits ought to be put into a line item so that these we have some sources of uh, funding to go back to to do those repairs. It's not the bricks. I it, it gets kind of exciting to see the bricks. The bricks will do well. They've they've withstood time and hundreds of years it's what we do on top of those bricks that breaks it down and so this being a major arterial road through our community we can sit here and just watch these dump trucks go back and forth and semi trucks and um it, that's what tears these up especially when we get into these sub zero degree temperatures in the winter time so i'm going to come back around again and say that we should be enforcing those and we should be taking part of that money from those permits to um create a bucket of money that we can go to to do some of these repairs for that and I think the time is now to be taking a look at that so um, you know some of these some of these um, renditions are obviously super nice to take a look at but brings pause to wonder what they'll actually how they'll withhold up to our traffic 
Yeah, one quick question. Uh, doesn't pertain to these two blocks, but one block that obviously has a lot of traffic is 10th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue, which currently is a very old brick street. So and I'm assuming in your plans that will be uh, concrete. Yep. And so is there any discussion or plan to repurpose those bricks on that street? I mean, they've been there for a long, long time. So uh, I don't know if there's been any discussion, any way to use those in the plaza project or somewhere else, but is there any thought or discussion on how to repurpose those or is that even possible? But we haven't got into the, the details of that. I do know that when uh, Ryan, I'm gonna throw him to the wolves, I guess, to say, when he was talking to uh, 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 the, the folks regarding Reclaim Brick in Iowa City, I think they voiced an interest in any of the brick that we would pull out of the streets okay. to, to, to do and use for potential other projects. So that okay. what they do is they take the, the brick from street projects like this and then, re, you know, then they repackage okay. them and sell them off. So, so yeah, Ryan, would that be a correct statement? So, right, thanks. But clearly I think if, if there's a way to repurpose them within the project too, that might be something. That I think be. that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, in the plaza. In the plaza, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, in the plaza, like not not the street here. I mean, I think the community would receive that. And well. then they know that those actually came from that street. I think that'd be kind of neat to repurpose that. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Well, cool. Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments for Tom on this? Yes, go ahead, Will. Are you wanting opinions Oops. on uh, the ADA and and uh, sprinklers this evening? Or are you just I well, I, I would ask for I'm you. always willing to listen to <laughs> the council. <laughs> I mean, we're grappling with it at staff level. I mean, I'll just tell you that. I mean, it's, um, you know, there's half a million dollars worth of improvements um, um, that are sitting out there. And some of that is going to be directly beneficial to the business owners, which, you know, is great. I mean, mm -hmm. we all want to see those buildings preserved. So it's well, just a question is how, how do we get there? I know you've got multiple options of how to approach it, so it might be good for you to put them down on paper and kind of what the mayor talked about with the with the bricks and stuff, and then uh, bring that back to us so we can. Because I know, mm -hmm. I mean, the talk of size of of the line, the water lines, the different grants that are available for ADA and stuff like that. So it'd be good for everyone to be able to understand understand all the different options. Yeah. Sometime soon, I would assume you would need yeah. to know that. Yep, yeah. we're, we're getting down to that point. <laughs> and, there, and there's different levels that you could assess, right? I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily Correct. be 100% assessment. It can be right. a certain portion. Sure. Um, so I don't know if there's something that you could um, come to a happy yeah. medium between um, the, the property owners in the city to, because they are definitely, it is a benefit to the properties and it's, it'll make their properties more marketable. And, uh, you know, uh, increase the types of uses, you know, mm -hmm. all of that when you have sprinkler systems. And, um, and one, one of them too is the, the recon, like if, like if that, if a Joe developer comes in and buys one of the buildings and wants to really redo it and, and, you know, put multifamily in and sprinkle it, um, you know, the, the idea of how that gets accomplished once we have a new project is going to be substantially different. Um, you know, normally they just go up and tear up a little piece of concrete and cut it in and then come back and fill it and replace it. Well, when we get to this degree, um, and I think Lon can speak to ordinances that have been in place in communities where you have to go panel to panel, everything that's pulled out is put back in and it's extremely expensive, extremely. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll likely bring forward an ordinance um, to, to that regard on how repairs and construction is accomplished after we make this. So if you're a private developer, you come in, I mean, you got some responsibility to, to put that back in a different manner than standard construction would require. Um, that being said, um, there's also, and we, we were talking about this this morning from a, a fire, pre, a fire safety, um, because we don't normally get into a situation where we require such an improvement of the part of a project. It might be a, uh, a conversation that the fire department will need to bring forward 
obviously staff as a whole would bring it forward, but it would be um, primarily identified through the fire department to ensure that when the project does go in, that, it, that those improvements are required as a part of the project. And so, because right now we don't require that a building uh, put in a water line specifically for a sprinkler system, but clearly this is a situation and it's not uncommon for communities that when you do such a massive and expensive project that you do this, you only wanna do it once. Um, so that might be another conversation that comes forward is, is how do we ensure that these buildings are preserved and what that means from a redevelopment perspective. So. Okay. Any Your other Honor, questions? I had a couple of, of things for Tom. Okay, go ahead, Renee. Thank you. Um, so the first one is just a question. If we do the um, no curbs, is that already ADA compliant or is there something different to look at with that? Um, I, I think it, it would be, I don't know if I would call it completely ADA compliant. Um, it would certainly be uh, uh, a better situation for those uh, with a disability. Uh, but, um, and the only reason I'm, I'm certainly, this is not my field of expertise. Um, the only reason I would say that is right now they'd be brick between the, even the rolled curb and, and the, uh, uh, the area that's brick um, behind, behind that area. So, and right now, brick is not considered to be ADA compliant. Um, if I can just interject, when you talked about the ADA accessibility and all that, the, the 200 or 300,000 or whatever, 200 some thousand, were you, were you referring to accessibility to the buildings themselves? Oh. I th is that, that may be where Renee is. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Were you talking about accessibility to the buildings? The buildings, yes. Okay. So yeah. you might make that clear. The too. entryway. So, yeah. Um, the made right building, uh, you know, there's just not a way that we can make that entrance ADA accessible without a pretty substantial improvement in the public right away. Um, and there are some that you just can't accommodate. And so there, there are exclusions and abilities to not have to do it, but obviously you want to provide it where you can and when you can. Okay, I just want to make that clear that it's beyond the curbs. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, and that's helpful. And I think that of every area in town, this one probably has to be the most ADA compliant, not only because it'll be brand new and it should be, but it will be the most visited and trafficked, um, et cetera. So, okay, that answers that. Um, and, you know, just to kind of echo, I think what definitely Randy said, but I think everyone's feeling, it's so exciting to see this, just the renderings of what's coming and what's to be and, and the past slides um, that you showed. When we sat down with Monica to talk about strategic plan and she asked, she met with each council member individually and she asked each one, what's your biggest, you know, what are your biggest priorities? And I told her I really had two. And one of them was this uptown project. I think that um, for tourism and our hotel motel and small businesses and really just the heart of the community, I personally think we should be investing in exactly you know, what we're doing and what we're talking about doing. Um, so this is exciting and I'm glad it's, you know, it's right here on the forefront and there's a lot of redevelopment going on. Um, that being said, I will put in my two cents for brick on the street and that is no. Um, you know, having done the homework that Jacob gave us to drive around and I think it's 11th street and driving down, is it, is it 11th street, the brick one that was on our homework sheet? Can someone confirm, is that right? So that was horrible. I don't know, you know, maybe it's cause it's not the reclaimed brick but even where it was patched, it was just, and where it's, where brick is patched with concrete or asphalt, you know, and it just totally goes against. And I think, you know, to Randy's point about trucks and wear and tear and snow and ice and salt, um, I, I wouldn't want to put the investment on the street. I would much rather put it into the lighting and the landscaping and the signage and the wayfinding and all of those other things that, you know, are, will be helpful and useful and have a lot more life value to them. I do like the brick, you know, around the sidewalk areas and some other things like that, but under cars, I'm not a fan of that. Um, but, you know, I would like to see it in other places. Um, and then I guess my last um, question is, 
does this um, current plan increase, decrease, or maintain the status quo with existing parking in this area? Um, I believe that it increases it um, in these two blocks. Overall, I'd have to really do some digging into it. Um, the, when we go to the angle parking on the south side of 7th, it really does increase the number of parking stalls. One of the things that we're going to have to do as a part of this project is really to take a look at the ADA accessibility stalls. Um, you know, as the density increases down here, um, we're probably going to have more uh, requirements for the number of stalls that we're providing in ADA accessibility. Um, but I think overall, we will likely lose stalls um, as it relates to, um, especially like on the north side of 7th Avenue, you've seen with the plaza design, there's a, there's a significant reduction in, in parking as that gets fully built. Um, so I think there's one of the things that we wanted to do at the onset of this project was really get an idea of, of the parking situation that currently exists and what we projected to be in the future. Um, when we started this project, we were right in the beginnings of COVID. And so uh, we have great photos of the uptown with no cars parked in them. <laughs> but you know, it's obviously not the, not the future, we hope. And certainly uh, it's difficult to do a parking study 100%. But um, certainly when we do the, the, the final presentation, we can, we can identify whether we have more or less parking. I yeah. know we're going to angle parking. Yeah, because my, you know, obviously this is going to bring more. And then we have the farmer's market. We'll have the library. And then we have that huge project where we'll have more residential um, in the, you know, in that area as well. And I think that parking, wherever it's going to be, has to be a piece of the overall budget to this entire project to make it successful and, you know, not frustrating for people so that we can accommodate people um, and, and people can get into the businesses and shop. And so I think it, you know, looking at it holistically, you know, I think as Grant and maybe Steve and, and Will, I mean, everybody's been saying, it'd be great to, you know, look at all of the proposed numbers that we can consider the different options, but look at it all at once as opposed to piecemeal, because I think that will help us prioritize what we really want to get out of this and what we're able to do, um, you know, when we're weighing things against, each other and figuring out what's the most important, what do we have to have, or what would just be nice to have, like the the light shining on the street with you know particular names of events, I think is cool, but a low priority when put against some of the other stuff. But I think to, to look at everything um, you know, all at once to the degree that we can and, and look at it. I'm glad that, you know, we never, we didn't go for the parking garage having looked at what happened to, you know, see our parking because of the pandemic. So at least we're not dealing with that now, but we might have to have that conversation again soon if it's worth looking at something like that um, in the general area. And, and if that has to happen, then it should be part of the discussion with this because this is gonna bring that need to have all of that additional parking. So just some thoughts to help you guys as you're at a staff level, looking at putting more things together for future discussions, but this was great and it's exciting. And um, I'm glad to be a part of council while we're looking at this project. Cause I think this is really some legacy stuff going on in Marion. Thanks Tom. Okay, go ahead, Will. I had two things. One, I can, I, Renee took the words right out of my mouth. I was gonna talk about the parking. Um, and I think if we will see a, a need for more parking in the uptown and that potentially a ramp here in the future, you drive by the new city lot on 8th and 12th every day. Mm -hmm. During the day, that lot's full. Yep. It's completely full every day. Yep. So the need is definitely going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, the second point, uh, we need to have a discussion soon about upkeep of this when it's done yeah. and uh, what's going to happen if it's going to be coming out of Ryan's budget, if it's going to be coming out of Seth's budget, I mean, where where the upkeep is going to be come from, because it's going to be something that we need, need to take care of for not just on a, you know, once in a while type of thing, but a continual basis. And the fact that someday soon there's going to be Smith District potentially in the uptown, I have to figure out what that's going to cover, what the city's going to cover as far as maintenance, 
So there's a lot of, a lot of discussion about how this is going to be mm -hmm. going down in the some, future. And some of those conversations have started internally. Good. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay, Steve. Yeah, just a general comment. <clears throat> I would have to echo uh, a lot of Renee's comments about where the dollars should be spent. So we haven't heard what the dollar difference is between those two blocks being poured concrete versus yep. brick or reclaimed brick. However, in general, if it's a significant dollar issue, I agree with Renee, I'd rather spend the dollars outside of the street. And again, coming back to Randy's comment, that street needs to be able to sustain itself for very heavy uh, truck traffic and concrete probably supports that better than the brick in, in, in the long term. And the other thing where you're looking at that intersection where those two people are crossing, I mean, you can always, it doesn't look as nice, but you can do, do colored brick, you know, or colored uh, concrete mm -hmm. for that section to at least accent it. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't look as good as brick, but you can at least, you know, color the, the concrete for a section or crosswalks and things like that to, to at least add some color and accent. Not as nice as brick, but it's an option. Yeah, I guess that's, so, I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to say uh, initially is that, you know, I was on the committee when we did, when we initially started working on the mm -hmm. streetscape and, and it, it, you know, it, it sounds nice and everybody thinks, oh, you know, brick, it, it, you know, gives you a warm feeling and it's historic and all that. And, uh, you know, it, it, but, but what's the practicality of it? And when you're looking at spending money, uh, is money better better spent on other things that are you're going to get more out of? And can you get the same effect by doing the strips of brick on the sidewalk? And is that enough? And 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 get in with the snow and winters and snow removal and all of that. Uh, you know, is it more practical to have concrete in the portions where people people are driving and use the brick as decoration? Uh, to still get the same effect, but it's more practical, it's less expensive, and the money can be used on the ADA accessibility uh, and the uh, uh, sprinkler or the Health water, the the water uh, issues and all that, so that we can, um, you know, make our money um, be used more effectively, I think. So, other questions? <clears throat> Okay, thank All you, right. Tom. So just just so the council's aware, those you know we're going to be uh, trying to finalize some of the design items. Um, you'll get the luxury of a of the consultants presenting to you, and they can probably cover these a little more uh, succinctly <laughs> as they're integral into this uh, design process in the future. And then uh, um, um, we're hoping to get that wrapped up here in the next you know few weeks so that we can start down the road of getting the plans approved and uh, we're on a short time frame. We want to get this built next year. So Colette, did you have anything? Yes, thank you for catching. I was trying to hit all my buttons at once and I failed miserably. I just wanted to um, echo a few things. First of all, super, super excited about this project, um, but I think it's going to be really important um, to find a way to really project, I don't know if the term is project management this out, right? So we have milestones and before we're making any decisions, we have a better sense about the budget and how this decision impacts a different decision um, as opposed to sort of doing a piece here and a piece there. I think about you know, the, the discussion around whether we use bricks or we use cement or imprinted cement. Um, also, you know, the cost sharing with our potential businesses. So I just really want to push for us to think about a way um, for us council to have all the information to make these decisions. Um, I think we'll make better decisions if we can do that. And then uh, Will brought up a really important part and this whole idea of maintaining uh, after we've done all of this really hard work. I spent a lot of time um, recently uh, during what Small Business Saturday, right? And um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to to do better in maintaining our uptown. Um, so just really want to encourage us to think about that as we continue to move forward with this project. Good points, Absolutely. thank you. I just have one final question, Tom. Mm -hmm. So the the artistic elements, these leaves, is that, I mean, is that decided or, or is that just a, a, an example? 
Um, there, uh, right now, I think that there's a lot of support for those moving them forward from the committee perspective. From the committee? Yeah, but I don't think that it's, those are exact designs. Okay. So. It does kind of look like Canada. But. <laughs> well, I think the idea was to tie it in with the um, uh, Lau Park. <laughs> but <laughs> with what? With Lau Park. Lau Park? And the artistic, the oak leaf. The, oh, so. oh, the overhang. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I, I think it might be worth uh, considering other options. But hey, other questions? All right, we have. Thank you. We have a COVID update from Lon. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, really, since a couple of days before Thanksgiving, we've seen some fairly positive trends in the uh, cases locally, but I would anticipate that um, until we know for sure whether or not there's going to be any kind of a post Thanksgiving holiday bounce, um, we're going to continue to operate using phase one protocols and then um, the experience that we see once we know what happens with, with Thanksgiving will probably inform what will happen with the other holidays coming up here in December. So I would not anticipate at this point that we'd be looking at any type of a return to being more open until the middle of January at least. Um, so there's not much change on the local front. Um, during the press conference that she held today, the governor did call for um, federal action for additional relief for businesses and additional um, tools for dealing with COVID. That is something that we're keeping a fairly close eye on because the uh, bank of leave that was specifically ex established for COVID under the CARES Act actually expires as of December 31st of this year. Um, but with the pandemic still going in full force, uh, if that's not renewed or extended, we um, will probably be looking at alternatives locally to ensure that we don't provide an incentive for people to come to work sick, given how contagious this actually turned out to be. That's really all I have on that, unless anyone has questions. Any questions for Lon? Okay. okay. Thank you, Lon. Oh, so I'm sorry. Did someone have a question? I thought I heard someone chiming in. Okay. Then the final item is the discussion regarding CIP projects for airport. Um, and I will turn over the meeting at this uh, on this to the mayor pro tem. Thank you. Okay, and who is leading this discussion here, giving us this presentation? Uh, City engineer Barclow will be doing that. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I know a couple of council members. Uh, have been more involved with the Mary Municipal Airport Committee than others. So just kind of wanted to take some time uh, to present to council all the different projects that we're proposing to come forward from the committee um, to the CIP group uh, for prioritization against all the other projects. And so just a high level um, overview first, this is kind of the site plan of the airport as it exists today. Um, so one of the, the big concepts or issues that has been an issue that has come up a few times are random vehicles that are either going out there for the volleyball or just happen to be out there and then ending up out onto the runway. And obviously that's not something that we want to have happen is a plane coming in to land or take off with vehicles out there on the, the runway. So we've been looking at ways that we can try and modify the entrances and add some fence. Um, we got some signs and some ballers back out there to try and prevent some of that, but um, there's still more that needs to be done that has been brought up from the Municipal Airport Committee. So if you can see the two Cheyenne uh, driveways, those are the driveways that exist today. So there's two of them uh, today. Um, so it's kind of confusing when you drive out there of where you're supposed to drive in to get to the airport. What our proposal has been, and we have talked to Luxair about this, is the center, um, I'll call it the purple, um, making one driveway in the middle, removing the two outside driveways, 
What that does then is we can expand the apron or the airport parking lot, which is the item in orange and make a, a bigger area and tie down areas. Um, and then making it more clear, there's also the fence that's uh, noted in there in green um, to kind of differentiate where the vehicle should be versus where the airplane should be. So we don't have that mix on the runway. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll go through each of the projects, these written your council packets um, to kind of go through. And if you have questions, let me know. I am in no way an airport expert, but I will do my best. And some of the things, uh, depending on how detailed you want to get, I might have to come back uh, to give you additional information. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So the first thing that's required is a beacon. And so what this is, is basically if you've driven on the interstate at night and you've driven by an airport, you see the light that's flashing in the, in the air. And basically it just rotates, one side's green, one side's white, and it gives the pilots basically um, direction as far as the airport's there. That's where I need to make my approach to come down and land. It is actually a requirement that if you have a runway that has runway lights, which we do, that you have to have an operating beacon. We had an operating beacon at one time um, that's original to the airport that the Rockwell engineers have tried to fix. Um, they cannot fix it. So we have actually had Anderson Bogert, um, our on-call engineer, um, work together to put a, a grant together for emergency application to the DOT for funding. So it is about 53,000. I believe it's either 10 or 15,000 that the DOT would pay for. Sorry, the dog was chewing on his toy. Um, next slide, please. Um, the other one is kind of a combination of all of them that I kind of explained earlier. Um, so it's the fence, sign, entrance, and drive. Um, so removing the two driveways that we discussed, adding one new main driveway that would come in next to the, the current FBO building putting in the fence to keep the cars out of the runway. Um, Tom really likes the sign that's out there, but maybe we can make it at least a little nicer than the wood fence that's just painted. Um, so that people actually know that that is the, the Marion Airport. Um, so this total is 155,000 to make these improvements. Um, this is something that we'll likely have to change the lease on. Um, or the FBO agreement, because we are making some improvements on private property, um, but it is for the, the airport and safety issues that we have heard numerous times out there that they're worried about. Next slide. So the airport approach is basically an inclement weather it gives the pilot, assuming they have a new enough aircraft that it has the equipment on board, basically a GPS guidance to get their plane until they're low enough that they could actually see the runway. And so it gives them an XYZ coordinate as they come down and gets them into the correct position so that as they say it was cloudy, once they get through those clouds, they would be able to see the runway and then manually land the plane. This is not an autopilot or anything, but it, it, it's something that is then having to update it yearly. And it's there's basically three different ways that you can get the, the approach done. You can contact the FAA and they'll do it for you, um, but that could be 100 years because we're such a small airport until they do that. And then there's two companies out there that can put this together um, and then they actually have to fly it and make sure that it works. And then they basically come back in every year and calibrate it, make sure there's not anything that has changed or impeded the approach. But it's just a way so that in inclement weather, when they can't see the actual runway, they at least have some guidance to get them down so that they can get closer to the runway and land safely. And if you guys have questions as I'm going through this, please let me know. Next slide. Uh, the other one is we have the existing Alliant lines that are along uh, 151. And right now there's the orange balls that are around them, but those um, obviously are a hindrance to taking off and landing. 
And so we actually need to get those buried. Um, so it's the red, it's the dashed and solid line on the north side of 151. It's about $180,000 to bury those overhead power lines. Next slide. Um, the VHF communications or the very high frequency, which is 300 to 300 megahertz, um, that is the um, frequency that is used both for pilots to talk to each other, um, to talk to ground control. You know, if they have a guy out there that's mowing to make sure that he knows that he needs to get out of the way for the plane to land. It also controls our runway lights. So at night, the runway lights are dim just enough so that you can barely see them. And what they do is they basically click on the radio at that frequency and they brighten up so that they can see them to the proper level and then they can land with them. That way they're not at the highest intensity all night long to save power. Um, so this would just be transferring the communications to the, um, from the, the FBO to the city to own them. Um, the public service has a radio frequency, um, engineering has a frequency, um, obviously police and fire have multiple frequencies. And so this is just adding another frequency from um, that pool to our pool for the FCC. Um, next slide. So the Quonset hut, um, unfortunately the derecho did not take it out. It did do some small damage, but not too much. Um, but in order to do the apron expansion, we do need to take down that Quonset hut. There's a little bit of items that are stored in it, but for the most part, it's just a remnant building that's out there. And that is dictated as item number six on the, the picture there. And so it's just going out and it wouldn't take much to, to take it down, but it did withstand the derecho. So next slide. So the compass rose, um, it seems like it's expensive being $62,000. And the, the picture to the left is actually the compass rose from Google Maps that we used to have um, out at the airport. Um, it's denoted as item nine on the, the picture on the right. But basically what this is, this is a way for them to calibrate their instruments on board so that the, the plane knows which way is north when they're flying. So obviously when you're not on a roadway, it's important to know that you're going the right direction. And so that, that compass rose is painted by a, a firm that comes out there. And so those of you that don't know, there's a difference between mag magnetic north and true north. And so they just have to get it out there and, and get it perfect. Um, and so it has ways for them to, to do that. And you can see that it has several angles to it for them to test their equipment on it. Next slide. So the RPZ purchase or the runway protection zone is basically what we call a no build area. So this is at both the north and the south ends of the runway where basically nothing is allowed to be there in a permanent fashion. Um, if you look at like the Cedar Rapids airport, this is farm fields. And so uh, obviously highway 151 is part of the north RPZ and that's okay because any vehicle that is there is considered a temporary impediment um, because that vehicle should not be stalled or hopefully not stalled along um, the highway. Obviously there would be instances where there, there could be, um, but nothing can basically be built in that area. So it's proposed to actually purchase those areas to protect those areas because we're not allowing anyone to build on top of those areas. Um, so that's approximately 666,000. Obviously an appraisal will have to be done and it will have to go through the full 6B process in order to purchase it, just like we would do for right away uh, for any city project. Hey Mike, do you want questions now or do you want to get through this? I, I've had a couple and I'm not sure how long this prezo is. Sure. If they have specific items about the specific things I'm talking about, I'd rather talk to about them while the slides are up. Okay. So why would we want to purchase this land when we can do nothing with it? I have I, I don't understand why we would want this. So be, because the property owner isn't allowed to build anything on it. And so most airports, in order to protect their airport, 
they buy it because why would the property owner want to hold on to it? But we don't own an airport. We do own an airport. I mean, we own a runway, right? We don't own any of the stuff around it for the most part. Like this, this makes us more owner because we would be buying into it more, but I feel like we have so little. This and the frequency thing, I, I apologize for not asking earlier, I wrote a note. I don't know why we would want to take that over either when we don't, we don't have the flight school, we don't you know, run the FBO. I, I just, I'm not understanding most of what we're going over because it seems like we're making an investment in something that there's no benefit to us investing in. So I'll start with RPZs since that's up. So again, because let's say that to the south, that property owner comes in and wants to build something there, we would actually have to say, no, you're not allowed for the zoning to build anything there. And so by rights, because we're telling them they can't build anything, um, you know, they're paying taxes on it. I mean, right now they can farm it as they're farming it, but they wouldn't be able to build any kind of structure there. Um, and so, because we're taking those land rights away from them in essence, we need to purchase that land so that they can't do anything with it. So we are protecting the runway, which we do own. So we have to do this. This isn't a choice that you're saying. Like, wasn't this zoned in a way that the landowner knows they can't build on it anyway? Most airports do buy their RPZs so that they control that. But is this a must or a recommendation, I guess, is my question. I would have to check further into that. Um, I know this is a recommendation from the Marion Municipal Airport Committee. OK, no, that's fair. And I'm not trying to jump on you. I'm just I'm trying to figure out what we have to do versus what, you know, of course, the committee is going to want this. And I, I were on that committee and I was pro Marion Airport. I'd ask for all of these things, too. but looking at taxpayer money, um, I'm not. So I, I basically, I, you know, the beacon so far is the only thing that sounds like we have a liability to spend money on, but the other stuff I question, but okay, keep going. I, I have a better understanding on the RPZ now. Thank you. Mike, before you move on, I got a question. Yep. So in the list, CIP list that we received, it's showing RPZ property purchase as a million 95,000, you're showing 660,000. And in the write up, it also indicated probably the cost per acre that they're using is on the low side. So the million 95 is probably quite a bit low by at least maybe a factor of, 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 of two. So, can you, are you talking, is your 660 the same thing as this million 95? Are these two different numbers? Two different areas. Have, I, I might have transposed a number somewhere, but again, it, it would have to be an actual appraisal. It, it, it is a high number. So we'll have to do an actual appraisal and go through the 6B process to actually purchase the property. So we're talking only land uh, north of the airport on the north side of 151. And the south side, it's both. And the, so both sides. Yep. Yeah, so it appears to me that based on what's here is that million dollars that's on this sheet is, is low by quite a bit. So the number as we move forward and even have some of the discussions, that number becomes um, obviously by far the largest item on this sheet. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can look into that. And then back to Renee on your other one, because that frequency controls our lights, and again, the city owns the lights, that's why we need to have control over those. So if we have a, another entity that controls our lights, um, we need to get them on a different frequency. So are we then non-compliant right now since we're not in control of this? So it's not technically, I don't know that it's a compliance issue. It's more of a safety issue of who we want to have in control of our license. Let's say that, um, the current operator doesn't renew the license and we lose our FCC frequency, our lights stop working. And then we have runway lights that we own and operate that don't function. Mike, one more question. On, on all, there's 15 items listed here. Are these kind of in priority order, any priority order at all from, a, from the aspect of a safety 
issue or the, do these have any priority? So is number one with the beacon, number one priority based upon uh, safety issues? Correct. They are okay. involved in the community. Okay, thank you. All right, next is the AWOS, which is the Automated Weather Observing System. So this is basically their own weather station at, out at the airport um, that gives them the conditions um, of the weather. So both when they're taking off and when they're landing, they know what they're dealing with. You know, if it's cold and they know that there could be some slippery um, pavement, um, wind, all those things that factor into the airport. Um, it is $380,000 just for that system out there. Next slide. The PAPI or BASI. So PAPI is precision approach path indicators and BASI is visual approach slope indicators. There's not a huge difference between them, um, but basically as you approach the very left diagram kind of shows you if you see white and white, it means that you're too high and you're going to overshoot the runway. If you see red over white, you're on the approach slope and you're doing good. And if you see red, red means you're too low and you're going to come in too fast and too hard. Um, so again, it's just another way to make it safer to land out there. Um, again, this is the city of Marion's runway. And so anything that we can do out there to make it safer. So we'll go on to, so this is 120,000. Next is the observation parking lot. And so basically the outside of the RPZs uh, next to Marion Airport Road on the south west and the east side, there's a couple areas there that we could do parking lots and observation areas. Um, obviously when they have big events out there, um, gives an area for people to park. And then obviously if you've been out there when they've done like the, the breakfast and the line of kids that wanna get airplane rides and stuff like that, that they have a, a safe place that they can watch and carry on. So that's about $85,000 for that. Next slide. All right, so is there additional questions on those items? Uh, there was one more item on the list that you didn't mention and that is the wa waterfowl mitigation. Yep, and so that one is one that there's dollar no, amount. Yeah, there's no dollar amount on that one um, because basically you call the Department of Wildlife and they come out and they do an evaluation on it and then they give you some recommendations. Um, so that one, is one that's on there, but it's there's not really a cost to it at this point because you're just using another agency that's willing to come out and do that evaluation. I have a, a one more question, Mike. Yep. Um, is anyone else who benefits from this, like the flight school or the plane owners, is anyone else chipping in for any of this stuff or is this all on the city's back? Um, that would be depending on what we do with the lease agreement, um, whether we want to charge them for any of this stuff, but these are just, again, the CIP projects that came forward from the Municipal uh, Marion Airport Committee. And some of these, I would say, are good candidates for going in and applying for some funding from the DOT. And uh, we did have a meeting with the current FBO provider out there um, yesterday morning, Renee, and they've got some information that I'll be visiting with city council about. Okay. And so I think, you know, to help me, I, you know, when we get to a point of needing to vote on this, I would like to see what what we're required to spend and what we're not. I, I, I personally don't feel like this airport is a good investment and I don't wanna spend a penny more than we need to on it for reasons like the Uptown project we just discussed. I feel like we should be channeling a lot more energy there um, where we have a lot more ROI than what is happening out in the airport area. And this isn't news to anyone. So I'm not trying to um, shoot the messenger on any of this. I'm just trying to stay clear um, so everyone knows where I stand on it, but this is a ton of money for, I don't see a lot of um, benefit to the general 
citizenry of Marion for this airport. So if it could be broken down by, you know, like the beacon versus the parking lot kind of thing um, in terms of ordinances that require it um, versus what would be nice too, uh, that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay. So at this point we have, uh, at least Mike has presented a list of, at least as I added it up this morning, about two and a half million dollars of, in fact, it'll be higher than that once you get the land probably considered. But at this point, about a two and a half million dollars of proposed CIP or proposed projects from the Marion Municipal Airport Committee to be considered as we evaluate our CIP projects. So that's where it stands. Uh, there's no decisions to be made about this. Uh, obviously, if some of those come up during the CIP for the five-year plan, we will have more discussion with them at that time. Any more comments, questions as we discuss these tonight? Grant. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to just accentuate a couple of things that Mike uh, brought up, and they were the basis of some questions. First off, as this was developed by the airport committee, it is a prioritized list at this point. So we need to keep that in mind. The other thing is it's been safety biased in terms of limiting liability for all parties involved relative to uh, preventing mishaps uh, from uh, or at the airport. Um, one of the particular things that I think I, I want to just give a little bit of color commentary to is number four, the approach. Um, the approach is an en engineered flight path, as I think Mike alluded to. It's, it's something that is, is de defined based on the environmental conditions surrounding the airport, which includes any ground-based obstacles that need to be considered. Um, and in that regard, the uh, approach is a safety attribute for the airport. Um, the way that works is most business class airports have the GPS systems that can be utilizing a reasonably high precision set of uh, GPS signals to give them orientation to the runway, whether that be on a lateral basis, right or left of runway center line, or whether that be altitude above the runway. And so what is ultimately designed utilizing that kind of a system is a glide path, if you will, or a flight path that brings an airplane under GPS guidance into uh, into the uh, into the runway. Um, so I think just from the standpoint of that opens up business class uh, landings into the airport is a positive beneficial impact that we should consider long term for the airport's existence. Right now, it's a hobbyist airport, but it has a runway that could perhaps support more than that. Um, I think that if we have the approach defined, and if I recall the number, it was approximately $100,000, and then there's some ongoing calibration of that year in and year out to make sure that it remains accurate and appropriate. Um, having an approach, and that information is published on aeronautical charts that can all pilots can use, uh, is an inducement for non-local pilots to use the Marion Airport. The other thing that is integral to that is it'll allow, and I do, do think Mike said this, it'll allow us to be able to use the airport or pilots to use the airport in inclement weather conditions. It could be they want to fly to Monticello. It could be the, the conditions there are extremely bad However, Marion might be the next best choice in order to have a, have a safe approach and landing. And then finally, um, having that available, and if that drives increased business utilization, that'll give us an increase in the number of emplanements and aircraft operations, which ultimately can factor favorably into an economic impact analysis. 
So besides just the safety attributes of an approach for safe aircraft landing and takeoff, I think there are some other tangential values there that we should uh, consider as we look at our overall CIP. Well, I think that brings up one other item we talked about in the past, and all of a sudden we're talking about, do we want to spend, we just spent $2 million on the runway, do we want to talk about another $2.5 million? And I think there was discussion in past meetings about an economic impact study on the airport. Uh, so I think for a lot of us, based on some of the past discussions we've had about the airport, a large investment is going to be difficult to be supported without seeing some basis for wanting to do that or what the impact and benefit will be. So we had that discussion. Maybe we need to also tie that in at some point if a lot of these are really going to be considered uh, beyond some of the first handful that are smaller dollar items. Yeah. I'm going to chime in here a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this is Randy. I've been uh, <clears throat> pretty much sitting in on these meetings over the last couple of years now. and. I think what I, I was one of the advocates to get this before the council this evening, just to kind of share this information because it's getting to the point where the rest of the council needs to be brought up to speed a little bit as to um, some of the details that are going on out there, where we're currently at with that. Um, some of these items are gonna be coming up on the CIP. So there's gonna be further uh, in-depth discussions about you know, where does that lie? And I, I do want to put some uh, emphasis on the priority um, that the committee has done a great job with. First of all, this committee has, uh, has really been looking at this through the eyes of a lot of different lenses and trying to be objective with expenses, but yet obviously um, very careful with understanding the operations of an airport. And so as this area kind of shifts and moves a little bit from Tom's realm over to Mike's realm. And we have some concerns um, such as like lighting, um, the beacon lighting, not only the, um, the landing lights that can be activated by the pilots, uh, simple things like fencing, um, driveways and approaches, making sure that we're keeping cars off of it. Yes, it is something, regardless of where we all feel on this, we do own a runway at this point. So we do need to make sure that we're shoring up some protection um, on this and um, uh, whatever the future holds for this. But I think it's critical that we all just make sure we're looking at this as uh, kind of a priority to make sure we're taking a look at some of these safety features. But nonetheless, it's gonna be coming up for further discussion um, with the CIP and the budget obviously moving forward here. But a few of these things are obviously very critical that um, I think is, is gonna be important for the rest of the council to get kind of up to speed on some of these items because they are, uh, very important. We put, you know, we put fencing around playgrounds at elementary schools, um, but yet we don't have one around an airport here that doesn't keep private passenger motor, motor vehicles from turning onto it, um, onto the runway directly from a side road. So, just some. I just wanted to kind of make sure we're bringing some clarity to some of this thing, this stuff. And I told Mike that I certainly would help support, obviously, the conversation around this and engaging the rest of the council on this because it's one of those things where um, I think there needs to be some discussions um, just so everybody's on the same page with that. So, you know, wherever we feel that we need to be on that, I think it's important that we make sure that we are doing the, uh, the right thing because somebody that's just traveling across the country and decides to land on that runway, they don't know our, our runway and they don't know our circumstances. That's not their fault. It's, it's a runway and uh, by all practical purposes, it is open. So, um, we want to make sure that we shore up a few of these things that we need to make sure we get taken care of. But nonetheless, um, I just wanted to make sure we, uh, I spoke on that a little bit to uh, just so that we get some people engaged with some side conversations to just try to uh, get queued up a little bit on this as to where it's at. It um, uh, certainly needs our undivided attention as we move forward with that. So that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. And we do thank Randy and, and Grant for their uh, input tonight as well as in the future because uh, they've been involved in the airport commission uh, and so uh, again a lot of us do not understand the importance the magnitude and how challenging it is and we do own part of that airport we own the runway and so uh, it is something obviously we will continue to deal with in the future 
All right, any more comments on this? If not, that is the last item and we are adjourned for the evening. We'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.